بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Firstly, I would like to welcome everyone to this masjid, both our brothers, uh, our Muslim brothers, and likewise our non-Muslim friends who have uh, joined us here today, especially the mayor of uh, Bradford. Welcome him, likewise uh, everyone else who has attended, and also the sisters who are upstairs. Um, today we have a small and short presentation regarding Islam. What is Islam? And hopefully, by the end of this small lecture or this small speech, a person will have a better understanding of what Islam is, what is it that Muslims believe, what is it that we do, and so on. So the way this lecture will be split is that firstly we'll talk about some of the objectives of this um, talk, and then... Point number three is very important when we mention a very important question. There'll be one or two very important questions which this whole speech will be based upon. And we're going to get to those questions and hopefully those questions will get everyone uh, thinking and pondering over the answers. We'll talk a bit about the history uh, of mankind and how the different prophets and messengers came about. And likewise, we'll talk about what is the actual meaning of Islam and being a Muslim. What does it mean? to follow the religion of Islam, what does it mean to be a Muslim? And then finally, we might address some of, or we, we will address some of the concepts and issues and key words that you may hear that which are normally associated with um, Islam. So the main objectives of this uh, talk is firstly to address any preconceptions. Maybe we hear a lot about Islam from different different places, from TV, from media, from friends, from families, maybe even from other Muslims who may not necessarily be the most informed of what is actually in the scriptures and what is actually you know, the true meaning of Islam. So when all of these different things are spread, then it can lead to, peop lead to people having different ideologies, different perceptions, different understandings of what Islam actually is. So we're going to try to address some of those uh, preconceptions that people have. And the way we'll do that is by providing you with the facts. What is it exactly that Muslims believe in? And if you, we're going to try to focus on the basics of what Islam is. Once you've understood the basics, then everything about Islam is built upon those uh, foundations. And hopefully, it will leave you better informed. So hopefully, the idea is by the end of today, you leave the mosque, you leave the masjid better informed and more knowledgeable about Islam than you were before entering the mosque. And also, as I mentioned, we'll try to answer the very important questions that, um, that we will come to. So, again, what do you actually know about Islam? As I mentioned, a lot of us, we might take our knowledge of Islam from various different sources, reliable, unreliable, authentic, unauthentic, and so on. So what's, what's our responsibility? What's your responsibility, our responsibility in regards to correctly understanding Islam. The responsibility is not to just believe everything which is spread on social media, not to believe everything that we hear from every person, whether it's qualified, unqualified, but rather to go to the roots and go to the facts and see exactly what does Islam say about these issues. And also it's our responsibility that when we come to read and to learn about these facts and issues, we do so with a clear mind. We do so with an open mind. So all those preconceptions that we've had, we put them to our side and we come with an open mind trying to understand what is it exactly that Muslims believe in. Just like if you had a glass. Now that glass, you pour water into it, the glass becomes full. But if the glass is upside down on the table, no matter how much you pour, the glass is never going to get filled. So if you've, if you've already closed off your mind, then you know, there's nothing that's going to benefit you. But... If you keep your mind open and you turn the glass the other way around, then hopefully um, that will benefit you and you will leave more informed. And you never know, it may even be something which changes your, your life. So, what are these important questions? So we start off with a very simple question. Why do you? I.e., you can ask this question to any action that you do in life. Why do you eat? 
Why do you go to work? Why do you relax in the evening? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? And for every question, you'll have an answer. And generally, the answers will be somewhat similar. Why do you work? To earn a living, to look after my family. Why do you eat? To stay alive. Why do you wash and bathe? To stay clean. And so on. So we now come to a very important question, which is, so why do you live? Why are we alive? Or what is your purpose in life? You know, we can, we can ask ourselves the questions about small little things that we do every day. Why do you do this? Why do you wake up at this time? Why do you sleep at this time? But the main question, why are you even alive? What is it that you're doing? What's your role? What's your occupation? What's your goal? What's your purpose? Because we now we're on this earth, right? Imagine if you just woke up one day in a hospital. You're going to be asking yourself, how did I get here? What happened? What caused me to be in hospital? So likewise, how did I get here? How, how am I on this earth? And if I'm on this earth, why am I on this earth? Is there something that I have to do? Like I said, you go to work. Why do you go to work? To make money, to look after your family. And likewise with everything else in life. So why isn't it the most important thing, which is our life itself, we don't ask the same question. Maybe some of us, we don't want to think about it. Maybe some of us are heedless and we you know, don't understand the importance of this question. Maybe some of us are too scared to answer this question because we know once it's answered, you know, we might get a shock. It might be a reality shock to us. And we know, and this, may be, this is something that everyone can agree on, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, is that all of us will die. All of us, one day, death will come to us. And there's nobody who's going to outrun death. When will death come? We don't know. It could be at a young age. It could be at an old age. It could be whilst we're healthy. It could be whilst we're sick. Whilst we're married. Whilst we're single. Whilst we're studying. Whilst we're working. Anytime. But death surely is going to come. So, we ask ourselves this question now. That if we're living for a number of years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, decades. Why are we living? What's our role? What's our purpose? Is it just to eat, drink, make some money and that's it? Return back to the earth? Or is there more to it? Also, you'll find people that they have everything that a person normally dreams of and desires in this, on this earth. They have wealth. They have health, they have fame, they have status. But yet you'll find those same people, they don't have happiness. They don't have contentment. You'll hear celebrities who have everything going into depression. You'll find other people who have everything taking drugs and so on. So is making money and having status and fame, is that our purpose in life? If it is, then why aren't people finding contentment and happiness in that? Likewise, if a person, he lives and he, throughout his whole life, he's committing crimes against others. And if he commits these crimes and then he passes away and he dies, he's not held to account. Is that something which is fair? Is that something which is right? That some people may do something small and then they get punished for. And somebody may do something so great and he gets away with it. Now, these are all questions that we should be asking ourselves regarding life as a whole. Are we here by chance? As I you know, alluded to previously, that how did we get here? You know, if we had, like, let's say, 10 balls in a bag, and each ball had a number, and I said, we start with the easy question, what's the chance of you picking out the ball which has number one? And that's, I think, inshallah, hopefully that's quite easy. Maths, one out of 10, 10% chance, okay. But then it gets more complicated if I say, okay, what are the chances of you putting your hand in five times and the first time you pick number one and the second time you pick number two and the third time you pick number three and the fourth, number four and the fifth, number five. And then if I say, okay, what is the chance that ten times you put your hands in and you pick out all of the balls in order? You know, the chances of that would go into millions, millions to one. So if that is just something simple with a bag of 
a few balls in them, then what about everything else in, the, in this universe? We've got here saying, you are amazing. Meaning, just look at ourselves. You don't need to look outside yet. Just look at yourselves. Look at how we have fingerprints. You know, 100 years ago, the police started using fingerprints as evidences. Why? Because everyone has a different fingerprint. So how is it that every single person, every human has a hand? How is it every single person has a different and unique fingerprint? How many people are there on earth? Billions of people. How many people have passed away? How many people will be born? But everyone has a different fingerprint. Likewise, in your eyes, the neurons you have in your eyes are millions, billions if, if not. Likewise, the way the heart pumps, when the baby is in the womb of the mother, how the food and nutrition and everything is going to that baby. And how the woman's body also changes to adopt to having that life and that baby being grown inside of her. You know, all of these things, we just, just look at the human being itself. And can we, you know, even now we can't fully comprehend everything in just the human, in our own bodies. So we ask ourselves the question, is this all by chance? And that's if we're just looking at ourselves. Then if you look at everything else in this universe, how the night and the day come after one another, there's never a delay. How the sun is perfectly far away from the earth, closer it will burn us, further away it will freeze. How if you go out and you just, just simply sometimes you go out driving and you see the mountains, you see the lakes, you see the rivers. Now all of that, could that have all come by chance? And as Muslims we believe that no, none of this, you know, all of this is impossible for it to come just by chance. There has to be somebody who designed it. There, have to, there has to be somebody who has created all of this and who created us and who places us upon this earth and was able to sustain it. You know, one thing is that one thing is that we talk about what's the chance of everything just coming into existence like this? And the other is this being sustained for thousands and thousands and millions of years. Without any mistakes, without any delays, without any deficiencies. And as Muslims, we believe that that creator is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we'll talk, who, who we'll talk about shortly. So if we believe that there has to be a creator, we come back to that initial question, which is, what is our purpose in life? And as a Muslim, we believe that if Allah, the creator, has created us and he's blessed us with all of these blessings from everything in our bodies, everything upon the earth, then we have to show gratitude to him for creating us. And therefore, our purpose in life is to worship the one who created us in the manner that he has informed us and he has legislated. So if he is the one who has given us eyes to see, then it is upon us to use our eyes in a manner which is pleasing to him and not displeasing. Likewise, if he has given us ears to hear, we should only try to listen to that which is pleasing to him. If he's given us hands to work with and legs to walk with, we should only go to those places and do those things which are pleasing to him. So this is the purpose of life that a Muslim believes in, which is to worship our Creator. And this is what Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created jinn or mankind. I have not created all of us, except I for one purpose, one primary purpose, one main objective, لِيَعْبُدُونَ except to worship me alone. Everything else branches off of that. So being good to one another, upholding each other's rights, respecting one another, these are all, they all branch off of this primary objective, which is worship, worshipping Him alone. So if we understand that's the purpose of our life, then us as Muslims, we say the way that we fulfill that purpose is by following the religion of, of Islam. So what is the meaning of Islam? What is the religion of Islam? The word Islam, linguistically, comes from, from the word Aslama, which means to surrender and to submit. It means to surrender 
and to submit. So therefore a Muslim is somebody who surrenders and submits his will to the Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He surrenders fully he, all of his actions, his whole life to the one who created him, to the one who gave him life and to the one who will take that life back away from him at the time of death. That is the simple meaning of, of Islam. And therefore a Muslim is a person who believes in Allah, surrenders to him and believes in everything that he has brought down. So he believes in all of the prophets that he has sent, all of the angels, the books that he has revealed, and so on. And we're going to talk about some of those things um, shortly. So who is Allah? You, know, you hear this name, Allah, Allah, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As mentioned, Allah, we believe that he is the one who deserves to be worshipped alone. That's the meaning of the name Allah, the one who deserves to be worshipped alone. And he is the one who created everything in this universe. And he is the one who has provided for all of us. And he is the one who has nurtured all of us physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, in all aspects. Before we were born, when we were in the womb of our mothers, it was Allah who allowed the food to reach us there. And after we were born, and as we slowly grow, we believe that Allah is the one who has created us and taken care um, of us. And we know that for a person, if he wants to become a Muslim, then there has to be a testimony that he takes, which is to believe that there's nobody worthy of worship in truth except Allah. And the second part is that to believe that Muhammad Wasallam, peace of blessings be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. So these are two parts. So we've talked about who Allah is. So who is the Prophet Muhammad? Who is the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam? The Prophet Muhammad, we believe, is a prophet, a man who was sent by Allah to the Arabian Peninsula in Mecca over 1400 years ago. And we believe that he is the messenger sent by Allah and his role was to convey the message of Allah to the people. Whatever Allah wanted to convey to the people, whatever Allah wanted to tell us to do and to tell us to stay away from and tell us what to believe in, then it was his role to inform us of that. Okay, what about the other prophets and messengers? Do we believe in them or do we not? So do we believe in Jesus do we believe in Moses? Do we believe in Adam? And the answer is, as Muslims, we believe in all of them. We believe in all of the prophets and messengers who have been uh, narrated. And what we also believe is that in the general sense, they were all Muslim as well. We believe that all of them were Muslim. We believe that Jesus was a Muslim. We believe that Musa, uh, Moses was a Muslim. Adam was a Muslim. And Noah was a Muslim. And, and the rest of them. Because we believe that all of them Call to the same primary objective, which is to worship Allah alone. So with that general understanding of submitting to Allah, submitting to God, then we believe that all of them were, were Muslims. The only difference was maybe some of the details of the legislation, how to pray, how many times to pray, when to fast, how many times to fast. These things, the, you know, the secondary rules, they differed, but the primary objective was all the same. And that's why, you know, even if you go to the scriptures of the other religions, we'll find statements uh, that would allude to this as well. Uh, if you would go to the Bible, there'll be statements where uh, it's mentioned how Jesus would say that I've been commanded to prostrate to the Father, i.e. to pray to Allah, and so on. And likewise in the other scriptures. So we believe in all of the prophets and messengers, but we also believe that after the sending and the coming of Muhammad wasallam. He is the final prophet and messenger. And his legislation and what he came with abrogates everything before. Meaning at the time of Moses, it was upon the people to follow Moses. At the time of Jesus, it was upon the people to follow him. But after the sending of Muhammad wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, we believe that everyone has to follow our prophet Muhammad wasallam. So if a person was a Christian at the time of Jesus, that was fine, because that's what God had sent. But after the coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's not permissible for a person now, uh, in terms of 
Islam and us believing what is accepted by Allah and not that being a Christian is not something which will be accepted by Allah. The religion of Islam and the book which is the Quran and the Prophet who is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what they came with has abrogated all of the previous scriptures and all of the previous rulings. What are the pillars of Islam? Just very quickly, because I'm wary of time, is that uh, there are five pillars of Islam. I, these five things are a minimum requirement, a must that a Muslim has to do for him to be a Muslim. The first is a testimony, and there are two parts to it. I just mentioned the two parts. The first is to believe in Allah, and the second is in to believe in the Prophet Muhammad. We have the prayer, that's the second pillar of Islam, which is to, five, to pray five times a day. To pray five times. So five daily prayers, every Muslim has to pray. And notice, these are known as pillars of Islam. Meaning, if a pillar of a building was to fall, then the whole building would fall. So likewise, every Muslim has to uphold these five pillars. The third is charity. I.e., there's a yearly charity that every Muslim has to give, which is from their wealth, if they have reached a certain threshold, a certain amount, which in simple terms means that they're not poor. So if they've reached that amount, then they have to pay 2.5% of their wealth and give it into charity every single year. The fourth is fasting in the month of Ramadan every single year, which we are doing right now. And number five is pilgrimage, traveling to Mecca, to the house uh, of Allah, and performing pilgrimage, which takes five days. And that is obligatory upon every Muslim once in a lifetime. What are the pillars of faith? So this is slightly different to pillars of Islam. Pillars of faith are six pillars that every Muslim has to believe in. So the first and the you know, most important and the foundation is to believe in Allah. And then to also believe in the angels that he has created, in the books that he has sent down, in the messengers that he has sent, in the last day, i.e. the hereafter, that after we die, it's not the end, but it's the beginning. After we die, we'll be resurrected and we'll be held to account for every action that we have done on this earth. And number six, finally, is that we believe in a divine decree, that everything that takes place, Allah knows what is taking place, He knows what will happen, He knows what has happened, he knows what would have happened if something else would have happened. All of this goes back to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what is Quran, what is Hadith? We may hear this a lot. What is Quran, what is Hadith? So the Quran is the book that the Muslims follow. So the Christians would have the Bible and other religions would have other books. The Muslims have what we call the Quran. And we believe that this Quran is the speech of Allah. I, Allah, He spoke these words. And he revealed these words to our Prophet Muhammad Peace and blessings be upon him. And that these words are preserved. So since it was revealed 40, over 1400 years ago until now, every letter, every vowel is preserved and is recited in the exact same manner that it was revealed. There's been no changes whatsoever. And you'll find that even children in the mosque, sometimes six, sometimes seven, sometimes eight, they have memorized the whole Quran, cover together, cover sentence by sentence, word by word, vowel by vowel, letter by letter. And it sometimes happens that if the Imam is leading and he makes a mistake or he forgets, you'll find sometimes a little kid would correct him. Why? Because the whole Quran, we believe, is preserved from beginning to the end. And we believe that this Quran is guidance for all of mankind, meaning all of mankind have to follow uh, the Quran. And as mentioned, the previous scriptures were sent for that, that time and that place. But now after the coming of the Qur'an, whatever is in the Qur'an, it abrogates that which is in the previous scriptures. And what is hadith? Hadith is what our Prophet said and what he did. And as we said, our Prophet's role was to convey the message of Allah. And you can also add that his role was to explain the Qur'an. So for example, the Qur'an says, Aqimu salah, establish the prayer, pray. How do we pray? We look at how the Prophet prayed and we take the details of that, the explanation of that from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Halal and Haram. You may hear this a lot. What is Halal what is Haram? Halal in simple terms is that which is permissible, what is allowed for a Muslim to do. He can eat, he can drink, sleep, marry, all these things are Halal. And what is Haram? Those things which are impermissible. Those things which are not allowed. So some examples. We have alcohol. So alcohol, so a Muslim is allowed to, to drink. You can drink water, juice, uh, and so on, right? But he can't drink alcohol. 
Why? Because the simple answer to anything, why is this allowed? What's, why this is not allowed? Because this is what Allah told us. This is what He has legislated. That's the simple answer. But then if you want to look at the detailed answers, then because Allah, is, he's, he's the one who has created us, and He is the all knowledgeable and the all wise, He knows what is best for us. So even if we think something might not be a big issue, big issue we think something might not necessarily be harmful, if Allah has legislated something and told us that this is not allowed, then we believe that there is wisdom in it, whether we know that wisdom or not. So an example of alcohol, we don't drink alcohol because of all of the issues that take place. You know, when a person is not in his senses anymore, and how many crimes are taking place. You know, we look at studies, I think the study in 2014, that there were just over 30 homicides, domestic homicides. Two-thirds of them, the cause of it was people being intoxicated, people drinking alcohol. So Islam has come to protect a person's life, protect the intellect, protect lineage, protect a person's honor, protect a person's uh, religion. So everything else which has been legislated has been legislated for a wisdom. Now I'm very wary of time, I think there's only two minutes left for the fast to be broken. So I'll just uh, finish here uh, and say you know, thank you for everyone for attending and also attentively um, listening as well. Um, like I said, the objective was just a general uh, presentation regarding what Islam is, what do we believe, and answering a couple of important questions such as what is our purpose in life, why are we living, what's the point of us living, and what is obligatory uh, upon us. Now it's time for the iftar, but I am around if anyone does have any questions. Likewise, if you don't see me or the sisters upstairs, there are many volunteers that you can ask questions to um, as well. Announcements? Yeah, so, so there's only a couple of minutes left, so we're going to ask everyone for the iftar if they can go into the side room. Uh, the food will be served over there, um, inshallah.